the 90s. Ah, what a time to be alive. Some of the best R&B music emerged during that era, including songs by brothers Yo, what's up? I'm Bri. I'm Chuck. I'm KD. And I'm Jason. We're, We're so for real. real. You remember them, don't you? They took over the Billboard charts with their two hit songs, 1994's Candy Rain and 1995's Every Little Thing I Do. Even though they were a quartet, they were often referred to as the 90s version of the Jackson 5, and they were eager to share their gift of writing, producing, singing, and performing with the world. Backed by their mentor, Heavy D, the brothers experienced a brief moment of success. After the release of their first studio album, everything came to a screeching halt. This is a story about creative differences, an arrest, and allegations that they've been blocked from opportunities. It was like pulling teeth trying to reach out to those It's called resources. being blackballed, man. Yeah. That's yeah. what it is. This topic requires something to munch on. So head on over to rrgsnacks.com, our online concession stand that has an assortment of beef, turkey, and bacon jerky, garlic Parmesan popcorn, and gummy sour bears. Raised by a father who was a bishop and a mom who was a reverend, the boys grew up in a West Indian household and sang in the church. The family moved from Long Island, New York to Florida, and then back to New York where the brothers decided to hit the streets to make a living. But selling substances wasn't something they wanted to do long term. Since all four of them knew how to sing, they formed a group and started performing locally. So how did they get discovered? Well, in the past, the brothers stated they were discovered at a talent show. However, they told a different story to The Breakfast Club. Brian stated they started showing up at different record labels and would sing outside, hoping to catch someone or anyone's attention. A woman named Robin was inside the lobby of a building and heard them singing. She told them they would be a great addition to the Mount Vernon Day talent show. She gave them an address and told them to go to the location to sing for her boyfriend and the other occupants inside. The address she gave them was 80 Bateman Place in Mount Vernon. The brothers went to the house and met a guy named Floyd. Now, those of you who watch our videos religiously recognize this face. But for those of you who don't, just keep listening. They noticed a bunch of plaques on the walls, but they still had no idea whose home they were in. They performed some of their original music for Floyd, and he liked what he heard. He told them, I'm going to bring you down to meet my brother. They all went downstairs, and sitting in a room was Heavy D, the then vice president of Uptown Records. They performed for Heavy, and he introduced them to Andre Harrell, the founder of Uptown. The name of the group that we had, it was like a real poppy name that it was like, you guys got to get rid of that. So right. We were, what was it? Da Fizz. Yeah. What? Da Fizz. Da Fizz? Oh, gosh. So yeah. for real, it's much better. Yeah. Much better. Yeah. The brothers admitted they didn't know anything about the music industry. All they knew was that they could sing. Floyd signed on as their manager and Heavy's lawyer became their lawyer, which is a major no-no when it comes to business dealings. This was clearly a conflict of interest, but the brothers really didn't know any better. They signed on the dotted line and were officially added to the artist roster at Uptown. Now, for those of you who are new here, be sure to check out our Heavy D video after we wrap things up so you can sip some delicious tea about Floyd and some other crazy allegations. The link to that video is in the description box. Okay, now back to Soul For Real. Even though all of the brothers were good enough to be the lead singer, Heavy picked Jace, who was the youngest, to be the front man on the majority of the songs. Chalk came up with the idea for a song called Candy Rain, and Jace told You Know I Got Soul website that Heavy and his team came in and quote, wrote a song around the song. Heavy and his team allegedly took all of the publishing for the song, and unfortunately, Chalk was left off of the writing credits. The song Candy Rain was released in November 1994, and with its sophisticated harmonies, the song reached the number one spot on the Billboard Hot R&B Hip Hop Songs chart. Their debut album, also called Candy Rain, which was co-produced and almost exclusively written by Heavy, dropped in March 1995. Within months, it was certified platinum.
A month after their album hit stores, they released their second single, Every Little Thing I Do, which Chalk sang the lead on. They also got to work recording a Candy Rain remix featuring Heavy. The brothers told The Breakfast Club that Heavy wanted Jace to sing lead on the remix, but Chalk thought he should sing the lead part. Chalk and Heavy bumped heads, and apparently it got to the point where it soured their relationship with him. The brothers say he immediately pulled the plug on them and deemed the group too hard to work with. All of their promotion came to a stop. Every Little Thing I Do was forced to ride off the success of Candy Rain because the label didn't put any effort into marketing it. Somehow, the track still managed to go gold. They told The Breakfast Club that after the first album, they didn't receive any calls back from Heavy, Floyd, or anyone associated with them. So with your name, number, and the time you called, and we'll get back to you later. Thank you. Things were declining at Uptown as well. Andre left the label to become the CEO of Motown. According to the brothers, they couldn't join Andre at his new label because Heavy had first dibs on them. So they stayed at Uptown and Heavy became the head of the label in 1996. Since Soul For Real had signed a two-album deal with Uptown, they hit the studio and began working alongside Sean Diddy Combs, who was a former employee at Uptown. The brothers were also able to play a bigger role on the album by writing some of the songs. When Soul For Real's second album, For Life, was released in September 1996, it barely made a splash on the charts. But not only that, communication between them and Heavy was still non-existent. Heavy eventually resigned from Uptown in 1997, but by that point, Soul For Real was a done deal. They were dropped from the label. They had no label, and they didn't own any of their publishings or masters. They left completely empty-handed and finally came to realize that having Floyd as a manager and utilizing Heavy's lawyers for their deal was a terrible idea. Looking back on their time in the industry, the brothers agree that their opportunities were squandered after getting into it with Heavy. You know, we, we know we were blackballed after, you know, we bumped heads with Hev. Then it's like, yo, he's the big dog and nobody is... Get him as a brother. In 1999, they released an album called Heat on an independent label. Sadly, the album didn't chart. They told The Breakfast Club they still tried to reach out to Heavy and Floyd throughout the years. There were opportunities for them to reconcile and rekindle their working relationship, but Chalk alluded to Heavy being uninterested in communicating with them. The brothers settled down in Atlanta. As the years passed by, Brian returned to finding ways to make money by any means necessary. He linked up with some men who were involved in mortgage fraud that affected 115 victims. Some news outlets erroneously reported that three of the brothers had been indicted, but Brian was actually the only one who was involved in the scheme. In February 2009, WSB-TV Atlanta reported that Brian was on the run from the police with one of his six children, a 10-month-old baby boy. He was later apprehended, found guilty, and spent five years behind bars. On November 8, 2011, Heavy was found lying on a walkway in his Beverly Hills condominium complex. He was transported to a local hospital, where he passed away at the age of 44 from a blood clot in his lungs. Chalk later told The Breakfast Club, So you felt, you felt like his we passing was karma for, for what he did to y'all? That's what I was getting to, basically. Uh, in a I don't nutshell. Say that, yeah, I, was in a nutshell. I, wouldn't, yeah. I wouldn't say that. You know I of course, people were outraged by his comment, and Chalk attempted to clean up his statement in an interview with Hip Hop Weekly. He said his words were misconstrued, and the co-hosts of The Breakfast Club lowered him into something he didn't mean to say. He added that losing Heavy affected him tremendously and that he hoped the entertainer's passing wasn't caused by the unfinished business they had together. According to Soul For Real, none of them were invited to Heavy's funeral. Brian was unable to attend, of course, because he was serving his sentence. Following Heavy's passing, they were still unable to get in contact with anyone from their days at Uptown. The brothers said they even ran into Andre at a club, and he allegedly ran away from them. Seeing the shift in the industry and how R&B groups were no longer getting the recognition they deserved, Brian convinced Jace to go solo. Chalk tried to go the solo route as well, but their music just wasn't hitting. They started consistently performing as a group again and even went on tour with Changing Faces, Genuine, and Case. 
but as of 2019, they admitted their show bookings have slowed down. They opened up a restaurant in Atlanta called Naomi's Caribbean Cuisine, which is named after their grandmother. Brian employed convicted felons at the restaurant to give them a second opportunity to be contributing members of society. As of this video, the location appears to be closed, but they still whip up authentic Caribbean dishes through their catering company. They've released new music, like the songs Sun Comes Up, Love On Me, and After The Rain. Unfortunately, their opportunity to reconnect with Andre came to an end in 2020 when Andre passed away from heart failure at the age of 59. In 2021, they were featured on DJ Cassidy's Pass the Mic BET After Party. Fans wondered if they would be staging a comeback. However, these days they have shifted their focus to passing the torch down to their children, who are also extremely gifted. And there's no shortage of talent in their family since Brian is now the father of eight children by at least five different women. Although several obstacles stood in the way of their success, Soul For Real still left a mark on the industry. Here at RRG, we thank them for the music that has now become an integral part of the soundtrack of our lives. Let us know if you're shocked by how the industry treated Soul For Real. And thanks for watching RRG.